Good afternoon, everyone. This is Eric O'Brien, author of Kerr's Rage, part one of the Dwarred Heem Staff Saga. Today will be episode two, The Jackal Wars. Uh, today's story will include commentary about people and events that inspired some of my characters and scenes. Uh, I'm clearly not a professional narrator, but sometimes you have to be content with what you have. Uh, the jackals in my story are based on the Dungeons and Dragons creature, the Knoll, from Gary Gygax's book, The Monster Manual. So here we go. The Jackal Wars. <clears throat> Lightning screamed through black clouds, and by that light, Carmen could see rank upon rank of the jackaloids massing beneath her. Her hands had grown numb from cold in the rain, but despite this, she tightened her grip upon her spyglass, scanning the enemy's army, preparing to shout back her fire missions to the catapult batteries above her. Her auburn hair was tied back in a tight braid, and her wet leather armor weighed heavily upon her. Although her weapons belt was firmly fastened, her swords could not be kept bust free, but that was the least of her worries. Her usually bright emerald eyes were now gray with fatigue, but she didn't feel tired, for this night was soon to become a battle of epic proportions, no less than a bloodbath. Hold fire until my signal, she commanded. They're holding out of range. It was Woden's day, the fourteenth day of the ice moon in the year 2030, and it was her birthday. It seemed strangely fitting. She'd likely be leaving the world on the same day that her mother had brought her into it. Twenty years old, and she'd already known five years of battle. Her service to her king had been filled with nearly endless marches, sleepless nights of guard duty, and too many moments of fear and pain. She knew her enemies well, their habits and battle tactics, their society, and even the legends of their demonic god, Inogulus. But the time for such reflections was gone. She had a job to do. Lightning flashed, revealing the enemy's bestial faces. Their heads closely resembled the southern hyena, with small coal black eyes drinking in the storm light, over long powerful jaws filled with the canines of a flesh eater. Their bodies were manlike, and their limbs, although slender, were powerful and dexterous equipped with taloned hands capable of wielding the weapons of man. They knew the battlefield well. Four hundred years of conflict against the humans had taught them the effective range of the catapult in Ballista. It was because of this that they so often chose to attack by night, during a storm. To most men, they were little more than beasts, but she knew that they were much more. If anything, they were nearly human in their cunning. The jackaloids milled about at five hundred yards, well out of range, carrying great round shields, spears, and straight swords. They were beginning to dance and chant, summoning courage in the spirit of mayhem. Their ranks were loose, but controlled by their most powerful males. At their center, the beasts began assembling logs, brush, and bramble. And in a short time, the mound of flammables had grown quite large. And, all the ro and although the rain continued, they somehow managed to ignite a mighty conflagration. The firelight improved Carmen's vision, increasing her horror, for the jackaloids had captured all six of the outpost's runners that had been sent away for reinforcements. There would be no help from Harg Pass, no more firmen arriving to defend Highcrest Garrison. Her terror must have been evident upon her face, because her corporal, Kerr Kegporter shook her from her vigilance. Kerr was descended from the same mountain dwarves who built the castle centuries earlier. He had helped Carmen's squad achieve countless victories over the jackaloids, and he was immovable in the face of fear. He was tall as dwarves went, both width and height the same, and his gnarled hands wielded axe and sword with ease. Older than most aged men, he was nonetheless young by dwarf standards, with a full black beard hanging to his waist. On this day he had only one job, repel any attempts to scale their battle and defend Carmen, who was the eyes of the castle. 
for if the enemy took the lower battlement upon which they stood, the castle's siege weapons would be blinded, and the Jackaloid regiments could then embattle the fortress unassailed. Carmen didn't move away from his steadying hand, but beneath it he could feel her tremble. "'We're all alone, Kerr,' she said. "'They've captured all of our scouts.' "'Even Private Angel?' Kerr asked. "'He was the fastest of them. "'They're torturing him along with the others "'in some dreadful game of cat and mouse. "'They're running free inside a ring of a hundred jackals. "'For a moment they see a window of escape, "'but it's quickly filled by the mob, "'and once one of them is caught, "'they're beaten to death. "'Only Angel remains.' "'Lend me your glass,' Kerr said. <clears throat> and he watched the young elf, whom he had taught the ways of soldiering, running for his life. Again and again, the youngster avoided the trap, leaping from one rocky crag to the next, ducking under the trunks of fallen trees, and scrambling out from under the beast's clutches, but it was obvious to Kerr that he was tiring. Run, boy, Kerr screamed in anguish, for at that moment he was with him, trying to find an opening, seeking beyond hope for a chance at freedom. But the jackaloids soon grew tired of the game, and they tightened their circles slowly, inexorably. Angel was beaten more ferociously than any of the other scouts, and their broken bodies were held aloft like trophies. Bastards, Kerr shouted, tearing the spyglass from his face as if he could banish the vision from his mind. I can't look on, he said. Your eyes are stronger, sergeant. Tell me what more you see. I will tell you only this, for mine eyes can hardly bear it. The beasts have bound them hands and feet to lodge poles and lain them across the bonfire to roast. Eyes swollen red with fury and sorrow. The wind whipping his silent curses into the night. Kerr's hands gripped the stone battlement before him, and nothing less than a titan could have loosened them. Prepare the men, Kerr, Common ordered. Something is happening. The jackals are about to attack. Tearing himself from his reverie, he assumed command like a professional soldier. His squad flew into motion. Two half-elven men from across the sea, two elven archers, a gnome, and ten furmen. Bundles of arrows were piled high, oil cauldrons filled, and torches were wrapped in cloth and dipped in pitch. Long poles with hooks were readied, for the jackaloids preferred ladders for scaling castle walls. Kerr and his men didn't look upon the sea of fiends below them, not yet, for common was their sight, and there was no need to fe breed fear too early. Fear would tap their strength and quicken the blood before it was needed. Their corporal would strengthen their resolve with phrases like, Remember what we fight for. And stay close to your buddy. Kerr was a whirlwind of courage. They fought for their freedom of their families, defending the lands of Ferminor. Below Common was an army of jackaloids, greater than any force that they had assembled in the highest days of their glory. In fact, every jackaloid capable of fighting must have traveled from their homes in the highest forests of the mountains. It was there that they eked out a living in the most barren of landscapes, where the winter wind would flay the skin off lesser beasts. Perhaps plunder was a necessary part of their existence, she thought, supplementing the ways of the hunter and scavenger with the spoils of conquest. Scanning outward, she could see them pouring forth over the rim of the mountain pass, marching down the steep slopes, an eerie black mass, much like the march of ants towards a kill. Trying to count their numbers was a hopeless exercise, Better to focus on the smaller parts, which she would soon affect. But the closest ranks of jackaloids consoled her little, for they pulled rolling towers of wood protected by hides, scaling ladders and various siege weapons with which they would begin their assault, tarrying just out of range. She wondered why they had not begun. Did they simply wish to frighten their enemy with unimaginable numbers, or was it something else? Looking upon the bonfire filled her with sadness. Her fellows would have seen her tears if not for the rain, sharing her horror if not for the dark. 
but she was a professional soldier, a leader, and the lives of the entire garrison would depend upon how well she did her job. Finding a sheltered place for her soul to wait, she watched with detachment as the jackaloids ate their prize, ripping off chunks of blackened meat and feasting upon it. Her revulsion was complete. She felt no remorse for what was about to come. What tribes do you see, Karaster? I see them all, she answered, in some standards that I don't recognize. The tribe of the wandering hunter has taken the closest position, behind them the crescent moon, terrible claw and bleeding heart. Beyond that the enraged bear and broken bone. Gathered at the top of the ridge, I see the twisted arrow tribe, and three standards that I have never seen before. One, one resembling a standing sword, another the arm, sword arm of a warrior with a shield, and a third looks like the broken body of a man. I know them, Kerr said, the stolen sword, holy warrior, and unspeakable death tribes. Every jackal capable of fighting must have come to the field. Turning about, he inspected his soldiers. They were ready for battle. Crouching behind the stone merlins for protection, they looked to him for their next orders. In the dark, their eyes were hidden, but their tension could be seen in the line of their mouths and the furrows in their brows. His longbowmen were spread out in pairs, half Elvin, Darchin, Odinson, and Leander Forestborn at the far left, and his two elves, Clogan Rosler and Nenag Drogeda, upon the right. His gnomish friend, Kalor Starseeker, stood upon a central embrasure, where he could ply his small bow with deadly effect, and still find cover behind the castle's slanted stonework. Between them all, his stalwart, stalwart Furman, brave human soldiers trained to defend the walls. Among them were Rafe and Sextus of Waysboro, Neil, Obed, Eowyn and Marcus of Handover, and lastly Maddock, Kendrick, Ian and Cedric of Khan. Striding among them, he issued words of encouragement, providing a powerful spine upon which his soldiers could find strength. He knew that the attack would soon begin. It was then that they began to hear the jackaloids' eerie chant. Their animal voices growled out the words to such an effort, effect that they echoed down the mountain and rang off the castle walls. They called out to the storm and it seemed to answer them with claps of thunder and gusts of wind. Kerr realized that dread was spreading through the hearts of his men. Striding boldly among them, he spoke to soldiers in turn, knowing instinctively what to say to each one of them. Dartin needed his faith, and others, like Kenrick, simply needed to trust that his tools wouldn't fail him. Kenrick, Kerr ordered, tighten your breastplate, but he was already cinching it tight for him, Staring into his eyes with firm resolve, willing him to discipline calm. See there, it feels safe, doesn't it? Yes, Corporal, was all Kenrick replied. Returning to Carmen's side, Kerr looked over the field. She listened to the jackaloids' words carefully and understood them. They chanted, Ye nog, ye nog, in an endless dream that seemed to drive their army into a frenzy. They are summoning their god to help them, Kerr said from behind her. They are calling forth Enogulus. Surely it is no god which they summon, for all that I see is a beast of horror. The demon had indeed answered his minion's call, and from out of the jackaloid's giant conflagration he rose, flames caressing his body as he surveyed his subjects. Standing at least twelve feet tall, his frame was gaunt but his massive bones were sheathed in corded muscles and leathery skin. Hands and feet resembling the paws of a predator, his face was like that of the jackaloids themselves, with a dog's hairy countenance, gray lifeless skin and a mustard mane. His sickly yellow eyes revealed a hideous, diabolical inner strength. In his left hand he carried an enormous flail of black metal with three chains of seven feet, each ending in a great spiked ball. His roar shook the mountain peaks. Bending low, he tore one of the scouts from his funeral pole, and it was merciful that life had long since left the man, for Enogulus feasted upon his body, methodically tearing off limbs and swallowing them whole. The jackaloid shamans who surrounded him raised their weapons aloft and praised him. Raising his arms wide, 
Enogulus embraced his people, and all the beasts pushed forward in an attempt to touch their master. For Carmen, this was a picture so grotesque that she could barely watch it without retching. Carmen, Kerr said, my eyes cannot see the demon clearly. What is it that your spyglass shows you? Death. We must be prepared. Their chieftains are assembling their forces. It seems that the demon himself will lead them. Call the men to their posts. Battle stations. This was uh, this small section where Kerr says, Kenrick Kerr ordered tighten your breastplate plate, but he was already cinching it tight for him, staring into his eyes with firm resolve, willing him to discipline calm. See there, it feels safe, doesn't it? This was uh, an incident um, that I remember from the Ranger Indoctrination Program at Fort Benning. Uh, we were getting ready to do a night jump. I can't remember the mission. Uh, I had already been through airborne school. I was in the midst of the uh, Ranger Indoctrination Program, which is a very difficult program, one of the hardest things I ever did in my life. And I was having a bad night. <laughs> um, previously, I had jumped out of the uh, planes. I, I was afraid, but not overly so. But uh, this was just one night. I was, I was probably really overtired, and the Ranger instructor could see that. So I was kind of shaking in my boots in my uh, equipment with my parachute on and all my heavy uh, gear. So this corporal, who was a veteran of Panama, uh, and this guy was so tough that during the invasion of Panama, he had a partial malfunction of his parachute and broke both of his ankles upon landing. And he fought during the entire invasion of Panama on broken ankles. So that's how tough this guy was. I really looked up to him. So he came to me and he uh, checked my gear. He tightened the straps on my parachute. He looked at me, looked at me in the eyes. And uh, I'm sorry. Those were his exact words. You know, he said, "See there. It feels safe, doesn't it?" And, uh, I don't know, he squared me away, and I made it through the whole thing, and, uh, anyway, that's why I put it in the book. So, well, thank you, and, uh, next segment, we'll start up, we'll go back to the, uh, to the tavern, to our narrator. And we'll continue on with the Jackaloids and the struggle of Carmen and her friends. Thank you. Until segment three, have a great night. And remember, read Kerr's Rage and the Dwardim Staff Saga by me.